throughout this stewardship campaign, I am inviting you to read through the New Testament book of James with me. We will be preaching these next several sermons from this letter. And so I invite you now to hear these selected passages. If those who claim devotion to God don't control what they say, they mislead themselves. Their devotion is worthless. True devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their difficulties and to keep the world from contaminating us. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim you have faith and I have action, but how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. It's good that you believe that God is one. Ha, huh. even the demons believe this and they tremble with fear. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I heard a story about two brothers who were engaged in all sorts of questionable activities all of their life. They were engaged in things like cheating and lying and swindling others. And one of the brothers happened to die suddenly. And so the brother who was still living went to the pastor of the local Baptist church in order to make arrangements for his brother's funeral. The brother said, I want you to do my brother's funeral. I want him to have a proper funeral in a church. And somehow in the message, I want you to make sure you tell everyone that my brother was a saint. And if you do, I'll give your church $10,000. Well, the pastor said, well, you know that's going to be very difficult because everybody in town know what, knows what kind of man your brother was. The brother who was living said, oh, I know, but $10,000 to your church is enough for you to call him a saint, isn't it? Well, the pastor thought about it. Finally, he agreed to do the funeral. So on the day of the funeral, the pastor stood up and he said, there are several things I would like to say about this man today. He was a liar. He was a drunkard. He was a womanizer. He was a cheat. He was a blasphemer. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. Well, being a saint has nothing to do with comparing ourselves to other people. Being a saint is what every one of us as followers of Jesus Christ are called according to the New Testament writers. Being a saint and being a sinner at the same time is who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Because, see, being a saint doesn't mean being pious and perfect. Being a saint actually means being holy. And being holy means being set apart. Being set apart to live a faithful life that is different 
from the life of those who do not follow Christ. To live differently from the dictates of the world around us by following God's priorities for being righteous and living in healthy relationships with one another. All Saints Sunday is a time for us to pause and remember those fellow citizens of the household of God who are no longer present with us in body, but whose memory we hold dear and who have now joined that larger city, the heavenly city of God towards which we are all traveling. And in remembering the fellowship of those who died this past year, we are called to remember the impact of their lives upon us and our own impact as we are called to follow in the way that they have followed, the way of Christ. Those who call ourselves followers of Jesus cannot get away from the fact that following Jesus means practicing a certain kind of politics. Now, I know you hear that word politics and you think, yeah, it's about midterm elections. And I hope that all of you will exercise your right to vote if you have not already gone to the polls and done that. But the politics I'm talking about is not the politics of the public life of government. That's politics in a very narrow sense. I'm talking about something much more basic. I'm talking about politics related to the relationships that we have with other people. Because you see, the word politics actually comes from the Greek. And when you break it down, it's a derivative of the word polis, which means city, and a word that means commonwealth. Politics, you see, is the way that we live, the way that we live in society and in relationship to one another. And we are called, as followers of Jesus Christ, to live using our gifts for the common good, for the good of one another. This means that life itself is political, and there is virtually no decision that I can make, no action that I can take, no words that I can say that don't have political consequences, that don't affect others around me. So on this All Saints Sunday, as we remember how the saints who now live in the church triumphant have lived their lives and affected our lives, the question comes to us, not will we be political, but what kind of politics will we live out in our lives? Will we live out the politics of Jesus so that our words and our actions and our decisions make the people around us better. You know, Theodore Roosevelt, it is said, read a book by a New York newspaper man, Jacob Riles, entitled, How the Other Half Lives. And that book described the slums of the city with all of its vices and all of its crime. And Theodore Roosevelt, as soon as he finished reading the book, at once went straight to the newspaper office but the writer of that book was not in. And so Roosevelt left his card on the writer's desk, and on that card he wrote these words, have read your book and have come to help. My friends, that should be the motto of every follower of Jesus Christ, that we have read God's book, the Bible, and we have come to to help in the building of God's kingdom. That we will use the gifts of time and talent and treasure that God has blessed us with to do the work of helping one another on this side of heaven. As we begin this new sermon series on living faithfully and read through the book of James together, reading it daily, 
you will recognize very clearly that James is teaching us that real faith is involved in the real world in actions, being involved so that our faith is visible to those outside the walls of this church. James gives us the example of the wrong attitude in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2 when he writes, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing to provide for their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith without actions is dead or idle, impotent, without power. James would agree with the statement written in the 1970s by an anonymous Christian, I was hungry and you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. Thank you very much. I was imprisoned and you crept out quietly to your chapel cellar and you prayed for me. I was naked, and in your mind, you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt, and you thanked God for your own health. I was homeless, and you left me alone to pray. You seem so holy, so close to God, but I'm hungry, and I'm lonely, and I'm cold. What is your faith calling you to do? You see, following Jesus means following the politics of love, of nonviolence, of non-retaliation, of generosity, of mercy, a brand of politics that sets us squarely against the grain of the politics of this world. The world says the strong survive and the weak perish it's the law of nature that we make the law of society. But Christian politics says the strong have an obligation to defend and care for the weak so that the weak can become strong. We don't practice survival of the fittest. We care for the neediest. The world's politics say grab all you can out of life and hang on to it. But the politics of Jesus says, anyone who wishes to take away your coat, do not withhold it from them, but give them your shirt also. The politics of the world says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the politics of Jesus says if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. Jesus says, be merciful as God is merciful, while the world says, just look out for number one. It's a pretty tough program to follow Jesus' words, isn't it? It's hard to hear, but it's even harder to put into practice. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not Fr St. Francis. I can't live that perfect kind of life. I'm not a saint. Ah, but remember what a saint really is? A saint is one who is called to be set apart. As Dane told the children, ordinary Joes and Sallies are called to be saints of God. Saint and sinner at the same time. Striving to follow those three general rules that John Wesley gave to us, doing good, doing no harm, and staying in love with God. The politics of Jesus call us to a politics of love, to return good for evil, blessing for cursing, generosity for selfishness. We're called to be set apart and to show the world a different way of living. Perhaps that's why on All Saints Sunday, we are recognizing ordinary men and women who lived among us, the saints that we knew. Saints who weren't perfect, 
but saints who tr showed us how to struggle faithfully to live the life that Jesus has called us to live. Saints who offered their service of time and talent and treasure to make this church the open, welcoming, and affirming congregation of hope and healing that it is today. Saints who showed us what it means to pray. Saints who showed us what it means to be faithful in using their gifts in the service of others. And in remembering them, maybe we can find courage, courage and faith to try, however difficult it might be, to be faithful ourselves in practicing the rule of doing good, doing no harm, and staying in love with God. The saints that we remember today lived out of the truth of those general rules. They were love-struck, God-intoxicated people. And as we remember them, we are called to walk in the same path that they walked. Stewardship is a time for us to remember that calling that calling to faithfully use not just our financial resources, but to use our gifts of time and talent. And that's why we sent out to all of you this week that ministry menu. Ministry can't happen without money, of course, but ministry can't happen without people either. We couldn't have this worship service today if Tommy and Alan John weren't back there at the doors letting all of you in. We couldn't have this worship service today the way that we've had it if all of these wonderful choir members were not back here helping us to feel God's presence in this sanctuary. Ministries, no matter how big or how small, are important in the life of the church to enrich all of us. You know, there are parents among us of young children and young children take a lot of energy, don't they? I've been reacquainted with that now that baby Joe's 13 months old. He takes a lot of energy to watch him. And we recognize that those young parents, parents even of elementary school children, need a break every now and again. So this church wants to hold a parent's night out allowing the children to come here so the parents can have some alone time. But that can't happen without some of you good folks saying, I have time, I can watch children, I can volunteer to be at the church on a Friday night for a few hours to give those parents a break. I can practice the politics of love even for couples that I don't know and children that I don't know, and to know that I'll be following in the path of the saints. The saints that we remember today did things like that. That's why we have Sunday schools here today. They understood that it takes all of us working together as the body of Christ to keep this church the beacon of hope and light and love that it is. Randy Frazzi has written a little book called The Connecting Church. And he says he has a son who was born without a left hand. He took his son to Sunday school one day. And the Sunday school was talking, Sunday school teacher was talking to the children about what it means to be the church. And she thought she would teach the little children something that maybe some of you have learned before. A little hand signal that says, this is the church and this is the steeple. Open the door and you see what? All the people. She showed that to the children and she said, now I want all of you to do it with me. And she didn't think about the fact that Randy's little boy didn't have a left hand, that there was no way that he could do that. But she looked as the children joined their hands together and they started to make their steeple, 
and then her eyes fell upon Randy's son, who just couldn't do it because there was no left hand. But before she could say anything or do anything to try to correct what she was doing, Randy's little friend, who had known him since they were babies, reached out his left hand, joined it with Randy's son's hand, and together they made the steeple and the church, joining together with one another. And Randy says, that hand exercise should never be done by an individual again. We should always reach out our hands and do that with one another. If you're seated beside someone right now, will you reach out and do that with them? Join your hands together. We are the church together, my friends. All of us using our gifts. It's fun, isn't it? Did you have trouble doing it? Practice using your gifts, my friends. So often we silo ourselves and we think that we are called to be Lone Rangers, but God has not called any of us to be Lone Ranger Christians. We are to join together as the body of Christ and the saints that we recognize today lead us in that way. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.